Hello, and welcome to the Katie Helper Show. I'm your host, Katie Helper. Hey, everybody. I'm Gabe Pacheco. Make sure you join our Patreon. That's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. And you'll get great bonus. Get extra bonus content. Um, Matt Carp coming down the pike. My handle on Twitter is KT Helps. That's letter K, letter T, H A L P S. Gabe Pacheco. His handle is Gabe underscore Pacheco. If you tweet about us, use the hashtag KT Help Show. That's letter K, letter T, H A L P S H O W. And please rate and review us on iTunes. And a very special announcement we're very happy to announce that our next live show will be June 14th at 7 p.m. at the Brooklyn Commons at 388 Atlantic Avenue. And our guest will be Angela Nagel, author of Kill All Normies. She's coming all the way from Ireland. And writer and controversial guy, Freddie DeBoer. Again, this June 14th, 7 p.m. at the Brooklyn Commons, because it is a benefit for WBAI to buy very affordable tickets for $10. Just go to give to, that's number two, give to WBAI.org, then put in the search bar K-A-T-I-E and Marie, M-A-R-I-E, the word Katie, and then the word Marie, and then you just buy $10 tickets. And what it is, is it'll be a live show about freedom of speech, and what is to be done about that, people like Richard Spencer and Milo. Then it'll have a short stand-up storytelling show, which will also look at freedom of speech, and then karaoke, the ultimate form of speech. We have a great show for you today. But first, let me say hi to someone very special in the room, Reggie Johnson, Engineer-in-Chief. Hey, Katie. How's it going, Reggie? I'm all right. Our guest today is Khalid Kamau. No big deal, just a Black Lives Matter organizer and Democratic Socialist of America member, Bernie Sanders supporting, our revolution supported city councilman of South Fulton, Georgia, which is actually a recently incorporated city. We're going to talk to him. Really excited. And he, you know what, this guest is so excited that he gave me one extra number to his home phone. One second. Um, Giovanni, you want to say hi to our, uh, can you introduce yourselves? Yeah. Yourself? You're such a big personality that I said selves. What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Thank you for tuning in to the oh Katie God. Helper Show. My name is Giovanni Anglin. I, I interned here at WBAI. I, I help intern for Katie, man. I just got her this iced mocha. Um, right, yeah. now I'm going to seem so progressive and woke. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sending interns to get me my iced coffee. I, I have a question, man. When did y'all start using woke all of a sudden? I did not know this. Who's y'all? Y'all, man. White people? Yes. You can say it. Yes. When the white people uh, started saying uh, woke. Yeah, I know. So woke <laughs> got gentrified a while ago. In fact, Ray Sani, yes. who's a very funny comedian, she's great. I had her on to talk about, among other things, Bill Cosby. In fact, we have to have her come on again to talk about the film Get Out. Uh -huh. really did you see Get Out? I did. I, I am afraid of you now. Oh, well, I said Jesse Meyerson was guest co-hosting with me, and I said mm -hmm. black women who date black men need to take them to see that movie. Absolutely, because, hey, I'll Don't tell you Don't give it away. Thing. Don't give it away. What? It's been what? Don't six? give it away. <sighs> Fine. But Jesse was very, felt very uncomfortable with that. I'm already really uncomfortable. Anyway, Are you? keep going. Because people mm -hmm. don't like to talk about you know, the tendency of, how do I put this without making people uncomfortable? There is a thing on a macro aggregate level, on a macro level, where black men, when they become famous, or when they don't, will date white women. Kanye said it best. Shouts out to Kanye. When you what get he on, said? he leave you for a white girl. Oh, yeah, 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 exactly. In that, gold digging. Yes, yes, exactly. Which and, exactly he did, too, ironically. Yeah, enough. I know. Thank you, Kanye, Thank you. That. Unless Armenians are, are of color, and I don't think they are. Although they're kind of persecuted. They're kind of. Yeah. They had their own Holocaust. Yeah, they did. They're the Jews of non-Jews. I know. Those are oppressed So maybe people. Kanye thinks this. he's not... Oh, my God, that, for some reason, made me laugh so hard. It's not funny at all that there is an Armenian genocide, but Reg <laughs> Reggie, like, multitasking, yes. making a phone call, and also chiming in to say that Armenians are oppressed, which they are oppressed. So, in terms of woke, Ray Sani is like, can't white people leave us anything? Yes! <laughs> yes! Like, you, the term woke. you understand why we don't dab anymore, right? Because Hillary yes. Clinton went on Ellen and she started dabbing. I mean, yeah, there's uh, so much. I mean, what about Mary J. Blige? Does she have any cred anymore? Absolutely! Hey, that you new saw, album was you, all right. Wait, but you saw Hillary Clinton talked to her, right? No. Oh my gosh. Oh, it was you didn't so know painful. that? No, when was this? Early before the election. Like three weeks before. The Hi. Hi. 
love your glasses. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I am so happy to see you. This is so exciting what you're doing. This is exciting what you're doing right now. <laughs> wow, oh, I can't wait to goodness. talk to you. It was so awkward that it made me like Hillary Clinton. Like, I mean, because <laughs> really? I felt such empathy for her because it was so cringeworthy. Well, from Mary's end? No, no, no. I felt empathy towards Hillary. Yeah, that was one of those rare moments. I, yeah, I she was really to, humanized, right? I wow. really, that, you know what? She needed Mary J. Blige a little bit more. She might have would have won. Yeah, it's true. Mm. If she, because I'm telling <laughs> that you, and that, hot sauce. yeah. What's something that you always carry with you? Hot Just, sauce. Really? You, yeah. Yeah. Really? Are yeah. you getting information right now? <laughs> hot sauce. <laughs> hot sauce wow. in my bag, Swag? Hot sauce. Really? Yes. Now, listen, yes. I just want you to know people are going to see this and say, okay, she's pandering to black people. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is it working? Yeah. <laughs> okay. not, no, I'm, seriously. Hot sauce. So I've, been, I've been eating a lot of hot sauce, a lot of uh, raw peppers and hot sauce. That's why you're coughing. You right. might need to slow down a little bit. Yeah, I'm having a rebellion against it uh, because I think it keeps my immune system strong. Oh. I really do. Yeah. In fact, I got into a fight with someone on Facebook because I posted a, a funny meme about her, like looking angry. And then it's like when you lose your mixtape and you spill your hot sauce all over your Newports or something, and it was making oh, fun of her, her like appropriation. And line. someone was really offended, and he was like, "She has been using hot sauce for ten years. It's great for the immune system." I was like, like "Really? Really? Like, I, really? I, I, I really? actually do criticize Hillary, Stop but it. that's not the yeah. thing." Well, that, you know, you know Katie, really. you get it up there now, so Diversion. people are going to get really offended on what you say. Yeah, now, they already so. have. Yeah. So anyway, woke. Yes, I think woke is usually the way I use woke almost all the time is in an ironic way to make fun of people who think they're woke but are mm. terrible. Yeah. Like neoliberals, like uh, like Hillary, like the Hillary thing with Mary J. Blige. So Mary J. Blige sang 41 Shots," the very it moving Bruce Springsteen <laughs> song, so it, which is about really? the shooting it of Amadou so Diallo. Forty one shots, and we'll take that ride. Cross this bloody river to the other side. Mary sang that? Yeah. Yes. It ain't no secret. It ain't no secret. No secret, my friend. You can get killed just for living in your American skin. Oh. She like held Hillary's hand. You know, what do you do when someone sings that song to you? Oh, Mary. <laughs> oh, Mary. Bless her heart, uh, Hillary. Is our is our guest on the yes. line? Oh my God! I'm okay. so sorry. Yes. Wow. Oh, I'm um, sorry for taking up your time. No, no, audience. no, Giovanni. Um, thank you so much for coming. No S problem. Stick around. I stick around. Cool. City Councilman Khalid Kamau on the line. Hi, how are you guys doing? Good. You. That was an hilarious conversation, by the way. I was enjoying it quite thoroughly. Oh, thank you. Well, Giovanni's like felling in the oh, corner. Hey, oh, hey, man. Th thank you so much. By the way, uh, Giovanni's here and also Reggie Johnson, the engineer in chief. Hey, what's going on? Hey, Someone congratulations. Here. Thank you. Councilman, you won your city council race. You were in the f one of the organizers of the Black Lives Matter chapter of Atlanta. You are a DSA member, Democratic Socialists of America. You were endorsed by Our Revolution. And you also worked on the Bernie Sanders campaign. And... You live in a city that was recently incorporated, South Fulton. Yes. What makes a city become incorporated? So for New York listeners who they've been a city for hundreds of years, there, there are areas in the country where there's just a county and the land in that county is not in any particular city. And across the South, particularly, but in a lot of places outside of New York, that's the case, right? We lived in an unincorporated area of the county, which means that we were in a part of the county that did not belong in any city limits. Ultimately, we decided to become a city so that we could have more local control of our government. Our area was being governed by a set of county commissioners. So I don't know. I feel like, I, I feel like I'm doing a, a schoolhouse rocks. Like, no, it's like good. I, Every, everyone knows, like, I'm just a bill or whatever. I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And I'm sitting here on Capitol Hill. Everyone knows that there's a federal government and right. that there's a state government. 
And then below that is the county government, and it's the lowest, most local level of control that an area can have. And we did not have that most local level. Atlanta is in Fulton County. And so unlike New York, where the city and the county are contiguous, like they're one one and the same, our capital city of Atlanta is in a much larger county called Fulton County. And all of the areas north of the city had incorporated into smaller cities. You see this happening in a lot of red states, in a lot of southern states. Ferguson and St. Louis is a great example of this. But what happens is, is that the wealthy, the wealthy suburbs of the city become populous and powerful enough that they form their own city. And, and this is important to know as well. Is like a lot of the really messed up legislation that we see comes from this group, ALEC. It just gets copied around the country. Oh, by the way, ALEC stands for American Legislative Legislative. Exchange Council, and it's a Koch Brothers funded thing, and it basically does tons of evil things. So one of these is this idea that all of the money, all of the, the, the property tax revenue and sales tax revenue, which are the two biggest revenue streams usually for local municipalities, all of that money that's raised in an area stays in the area. Like that's it's it's a it's an act usually of the legislature, maybe of the county, but in these conservative districts. So what happens is wealthy enclaves form their own city, then they get this legislation passed, which means that all of the money that's spent at their wealthy shopping districts and all of the money that's generated from their wealthy homes has to be spent only on them and not on anyone else. And, and and you talk about the importance of local politics, and I think it's important to talk about that because they are n- not as sexy, they're not as covered, obviously, as national ones. And I listened to an interview that you had with Sarah Jaffe, and you said something really interesting about how you need to have progressives on city councils on more local levels because that shows to people that things like $15 minimum wage, for instance, that shows people that it can actually work and that it's not just pie in the sky? Right. So this is how you build the argument. There are two really important reasons that really brilliant folks like Bernie Sanders want us to start running for local seats. And the first is exactly what you said, and that is particularly in the South, right, where we don't have a lot of progressive policies or progressive politicians. One of the things that we hear is that, oh, a $15 minimum wage only works in like Silicon Valley or right. or Seattle where everyone's like rich. Or universal health care only works in Boston because there's no poor people in right. Boston. Everyone can afford it. So the only way to really combat that is to see those policies happen at a local level where the stakes are a lot smaller. And then when people can say, oh, they decriminalized marijuana in the city of Clarkston, Georgia, for example, and the the rates of drug use didn't shoot up and it didn't become this crazy place, then it's like, okay, well, maybe we can try it in a larger city like Atlanta. No, maybe we can try it at the state level. You know, maybe it'll work in, for the whole nation because it's working. In, and, and that's what we saw with healthcare, right? It's actually what we see with a lot of things, whether it's good things or bad things, whether it's the health care system or whether it's right. the lottery. One state does it, decriminalizing marijuana. Colorado does it. The tax revenues from marijuana outpace the tax revenues for alcohol. All of a sudden, all these other states are like, we got to get in on this. So that's, that's the first reason. The second reason is, is if you look at the average age of the Democratic House leadership, it's like 72. Mm. When you look at the average age of the Republican House leadership, it's 46. Wow. Had no idea about that. So when you go to a college Democrats meeting, and I I can say this because I traveled around the state of Georgia in between Bernie and this, uh, it was so after the primaries, but, but before my own election this spring, I worked for the Georgia House Democratic Caucus. When you go to a college Democrats meeting, they're having pizza parties and maybe watching presidential debates. Mm -hmm. When you go to a college Republicans meeting, they have members of the Heritage Foundation coming and lecturing them. Republican state reps are bringing them to the state legislature to see how a bill becomes a law. They're even high school young Republican chapters now. So they start training at very young ages. They start identifying talent. They get those people into 
slots as legislative aides, then maybe they run for office, or they become policy aides, and then they're clerking for someone, right. and the next thing you know, they have a bench of nominees for the, for the Supreme Court. And so that's why all of the youngest members of the Supreme Court, including John Roberts, our, our chief justice, like they right. all come out of these, these clubs and these like young Republican societies and these federalist societies because they have built this pipeline of leadership. And so that's the other important reason. It's because you can be 25, you can be 19. We had a young lady who was 19 who almost won a seat mm. in another city here in Georgia. But you can be 19, 20, 21 and become a city council person and, and work your way up. And by the time you're ready to run for governor, you've had all of this experience, you've run all of these campaigns. Right. And, and the same is also true for our volunteers. Like the state of campaigning now is, is really data-driven. You need to know how to use these tools, how to micro-target voters and all of that. And so all of that practice is what happens at the local level. That's Yeah, that's really funny because I definitely think of Republicans as older, whiter, straighter, maler than Democrats. So good to know that I'm totally wrong. I guess it's all optics. Democrats are good at spinning that. As someone who was part of Black Lives Matter and you and you were part of the one of the people who helped found it, the Atlanta chapter of Black Lives Matter, you focused on marijuana sentencing and on accountability around police uh, actually i call it uh and some of us in atlanta we call it blue on black crime right blue on black crime right two nodding heads in the room right now three because i nodded too you worked on something to address the lack of prosecution of blue on black crime and also on marijuana sentencing discrepancies what of those things can you work on now as a city councilman and and how do you work on them well, actually let's start let's start with black lives matter because okay. here's an interesting fact yes i may be the first black lives matter activist in the country that has been elected to a public office wow uh, thank you thank you thank that's you, thank really, you. yeah I may be. We need to, you have to have your brilliant fact checkers at BAI uh, look that up. But I, as far as I know, I'm the first, but I won't be the last. Right. There are people that have been running. Of course, the Ray ran in, in, in Baltimore, right. associated with the movement. There were some candidates that were running in St. Louis. So, yeah, that's, that, is, that is critically important. One of the things that, that we are looking at doing right now is decriminalizing marijuana for less than an ounce in uh, the new city of South Fulton. The city of South Fulton is going to be uh, the largest uh, city that's been incorporated in Georgia in 100 years. It's the second largest by land area, uh, second only to Atlanta itself in the metro, in the, in the Atlanta metro area, and it's 89% African American. And what we know is that, with the exception of D.C., most of the places that decriminalized marijuana have not been majority black cities, even though mm. the majority of people in this country that are arrested for marijuana, the majority of people in this country that are over-prosecuted for all sorts of drug crimes, that we've been disproportionately targeted. And, and you don't, know, and it's not that people of color do drugs more or commit no, the crimes though, more. It's, right, so, and so the ACLU did a really brilliant report on this, I think, in 2015. They went on to show that even though black folks and white folks smoke marijuana at, like, the same rates, I'm right. not sure how they got that statistic, but uh, right, yeah. I have found it to be true yeah. that... That we, are, that we are prosecuted two and a half times more. And actually, Georgia is one of the states that has the most disproportionate amount of prosecution. So that, for example, in the city of Atlanta, even though African-American males make up less than 25% of the population, we make up 97% of wow. the, the arrests for marijuana, right? And so by decriminalizing it, you are decriminalizing African-American men, and particularly in a, in a city like ours, so we're a new city, I mean, in a city that with, an, with a majority African-American population where we are being more disproportionately impacted, here we go, Bernie Sanders, by income inequality. So yes. it's harder for African-American males to get jobs. It's just a very well-documented you know, statistical yeah. thing, right? And, and then having a drug conviction makes it even that much harder to get drug, jobs. Having a drug conviction also blocks you often from receiving federal student loans, mm. which becomes another, you know, so now you can't right. get a college education. So all of these and things really sort of com- even less employable, even less employable. All of these things sort of compound. But but another interesting statistic that when you nerd out at the local <laughs> level is that many smaller municipalities don't run their own jails. So, for example, in our new city, to jail someone is going to cost between 60 and 70 dollars a day. So whereas if we if the police stop someone and they find marijuana and they're able to write a ticket for 60 dollars, the city has made 60 dollars. If we arrest that person, 
then we're going to spend at least $100 jailing them on top of whatever we have to pay in court costs. They don't have um, a public defender, but they're entitled to one, so the city is paying for that as well. You know, so, like, there are, there are a lot of costs associated with over-policing, and that's one of the things that the Ferguson Commission found in this report, is that over-policing, you spend a significant amount of your money in a municipality on, like, trying to run this prison system or the system of money bail and things like that. So that's a big thing that we're working on. The other the issue that we're working on is making sure that police look like and live like the people mm. that, they are, that they are policing. An alarming statistic for Georgia is that in, set in the past seven years, we've had over 70 people that have been killed by police, 70 people of all different colors, right, that have been killed by the police. None of them have had a trial. Not even a trial. So not, not, even not trial. that they weren't convicted, but they weren't even charged. Weren't even charged. And so, you know, to me, at, at, at minimum, so, the way that I see it is that when someone is killed, a trial is like a conversation. Let's mm. have a public conversation about what you did and try and figure out if there was, if, if there was another way that things could have happened. So that in 70 cases, what we've heard is that it's not even worth having a conversation about why these people are dead. So one of the things that I will be pushing as a councilman is making sure that our new hires in as much as possible, we're going to try and require that our police chief live in our city limits, but then we can incentivize, and many, and many local police officers, they give points, the applications are scored. And so you get points, for example, being a veteran, which was, I think, a nice honorable thing when people were not coming back from active military duty. Yes. But I'm not sure that we should be giving points for people who are coming back from war zones with and probably giving them PTSD. preferential treatment. Right. right? And probably there is a lot of PTSD. We know that. There's not- a lot of PTSD. This is not a war zone, despite what Donald Trump or Steve Bannon has you thinking, like, you know, inner cities are not war zones. Right, 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 right. Not be militarized right. and walking around and thinking about it like that. But what we could be incentivizing is people who have lived in that community. So if they've already bought a home and they've lived there for two years, we could get points for that. If they graduated from high school, if they went to a high school in that city, we could be giving points for that. And just trying to find ways like that to incentivize people who are actually from communities to actually be police. I mean, just to, to speak to the, the question of not treating a quote-unquote inner city as a war zone, I don't know if you heard about this, but an officer in Weirton, West Virginia, was actually, he, he claims, and he's suing, he claims that he was fired because he did not shoot someone. Um, oh this is reading from the Times. It's before dawn on May 6, t- 2016. A white police officer found himself face-to-face with a young black man holding a silver pistol. The officer could have fired a shot, but he didn't. That officer is now suing the city, arguing that his show of restraint cost him his job. So, yeah, some other police showed up and did shoot the the person. They said he had, like, an inability to perform his job, which is pretty problematic, to put it lightly. Right. There's a case we had um, in the in the town adjacent to us, Union City, Georgia. We had uh, a young man, Ariston Waiters. He was, like, 19 years old. He's a father, and he was shot in the back multiple times while handcuffed. So he's on the ground, face down, handcuffed, shot in the back wow. multiple times. No trial. And, it, you know, it, it has come out that the officer who shot him had disciplinary file right. and people have been concerned about him having PTSD. And people had said that since he had come back, I think he was a reserve officer, but since he had come back from Afghanistan, like the second time, that he seemed different and, and, and people were worried about him. So, yeah, that's obviously... Yeah, that's the thing that's so disturbing and so negligent and why these police departments actually have blood on their hands, not just the officer who does it, but because in so many cases you see that there have been so many things that happened before, right? So many people have filed complaints, and instead of being fired, the person is, like, barely disciplined, given a slap on the wrist. So all these places, a lot of times, they could have prevented this, right? It's not like this came out of nowhere, and they didn't have records, which is just so disturbing, because it really makes the the crime, you know, the higher-ups are complicit in the crime. It is, and and, and, and that these two things... Um, are actually tied together, right? Because a lot of a lot of times, the, um, the the reason offered for why someone is stopped or why someone is searched or why someone is harassed is because they smell marijuana, mm, right? right? So, like, if we just take that off the table, like, how many how many young black men could escape harassment um, if the only if if that becomes the reason, you know? And that, and there's no way to really 
there's no way to really certify that. You know, you if an officer said he smelled marijuana, like you can't go back in time and be like, you can't send someone back to the scene to sniff and be like, oh, it does smell like marijuana. Right. But that being the um, the pretense for a lot of harassment, if you if you take away one, you take away the other. And and one of the things that um, a lot of, of police supporters, they love to talk about, of course, like this broken windows theory and that we need more community policing and but what study after study has found is that they have actually debunked the original right. broken window study. But unfortunately, what has happened is that the more money that's put into broken windows policing or, or stop and frisk and the more money that's put into predictive policing and harassing people in purportedly high crime areas, the more money that is actually taken out of detective units. So across the country, many detectives, many detective units have seen their uh, personnel decimated and the number of unsolved cases actually goes up. And now new studies are showing that this is actually a predictor of crime, that maybe we should spend more time trying to solve burglaries and armed robberies than we do ticketing people for speeding or smoking marijuana, like that our priorities are in the wrong place. And the way that that works on a municipal level for anybody who's running and trying to sell this in their own municipalities is that very often in their local municipality, Juvenile crime is done by a county court, and those major crimes are done by state courts. So if you're looking for a way to cut costs, it's actually more cost-effective for a city or a township to focus on part one crimes, which are the you know major crimes, murder, armed robbery, whatever, because when you make arrests, you then shift the burden for housing those people for going through those cases, they get shifted away from your local municipality to your county um, or your state court. And so you don't have to pay those fees. You don't have to pay to house those prisoners. You're able to bring your crime rate down by solving more cases. Right. It's like when Arpaio, Sheriff Joe Arpaio, would pursue people for basically being brown. And because he was doing that and making his officers do that, uh, there were a lot of sexual assault cases that just didn't even get looked into. Right. So can you talk to us about Bernie? You, In your interview with Sarah Jaffe, you say it all started with Bernie. It really did. It, um, well, I, sh- I shouldn't say that it all started with Bernie. I have been a community activist for my entire life. My first protest was actually in seventh grade. That was about not enough African... Country. So we had field day. Did you guys have field day in, yes. in elementary school? So they tried to do this thing where they, they, were, they tried to make field day educational. We kept all of the same events, tug of war or whatever, kickball, but we then all had to represent a country. So each homeroom became a country, and we had to do like research on that country. And even I was at this school that was like 90% African-American, but all of the countries were like European countries. We were like Greece and Yugoslavia or whatever. I was like, we should have some African countries for, you know, all of these black students. We should be doing research on whatever African countries are participating in the Olympics. So I did a petition. They didn't take us seriously because we're 12, so we staged a walkout. I don't know, somehow I, I had a really great media teacher and... He helped me get in contact with the news and write my first press release. So the news came. It became a thing. That was my first taste. And I realized, oh, like, if you make enough noise, like, you can get change. You can get the things that you want. You can get people to take you seriously. So that's just been part of who I was for a long time. And then I was a community organizer. I, uh, you know, worked in my whatever community I lived in. You know, I started neighborhood crime watches or resident associations to deal with landlords that weren't providing services. So that's always been in my blood. A couple of years ago, I was driving a paratransit bus. You guys call them accessorized. Here, we call them MARTA is the name of our thing. So it's MARTA Mobility. I was driving this paratransit bus. Remember, we're not, we're not a, a pro-union state. People who ran the company got some advice from KPMG that they should outsource, that the way to get out of our union contract or the way, the way for our company to get out of its union contract and its union obligations was to outsource the company. If they outsourced the company or they outsourced the service, then everyone would have to reapply for their jobs, which means that we'd have to like, they'd have to start the process right. all over right. in forming a union. They could get out of paying all of their pension obligations and their, the great health insurance plans that we have for these drivers who all made less than $15 an hour. Wow. And, you know, many of us were were working there because of the benefits, because of the pension. We certainly weren't working there because of the pay. 
So around the time that happened, about 300, over 300 drivers and mechanics lost their health insurance, and a lot of us lost our pensions. And there was this guy from Vermont that was talking about income inequality and how corporations were getting out of control and the 1% was just taking way too much money. And I was like, absolutely. So I was very excited about him. But when I would go to talk about my neighbor, we were on board for Bernie Sanders. And so I went and didn't hear him talk about race. Those of us who know that race and class are intimately intertwined, we were on board for Bernie Sanders. And so much as they just as they being the establishment Dems, the kind of DNC, Wall Street Dems, whatever, much as they just as they being the establishment Dems, the kind of DNC, Wall Street Dems, whatever, continue to do so. And he didn't actually like brag about his civil rights record. He continued to help so, organize one of the first sit-ins in like, Chicago about right. his civil rights record. I think record. he also was a, a secret shopper or he did something around. They, they had people renting the housing for University of Chicago. They only they did this undercover the thing where two white were people were not go renting and would rent out to, to and then black, two black students. people would do it and they wouldn't so get it. So they did this undercover no, that wasn't thing what he where got two white people for. That's what he did the sit-in for. And two black people would do it and they wouldn't get it. Um, and then when they did hear of him, they heard him talk about class a lot, but they didn't hear him talk about race. Those of us who know that race and class are intimately intertwined, we were on board for Bernie Sanders. And, and of course, his record, as much as they just, as they being the establishment Dems, the kind of DNC, Wall Street Dems, whatever. It's so insane how much they distorted that and continue to do so. And he didn't actually like brag about his Continued to help organize one of the first sit-ins in Chicago. Right. I think that he also was a, a secret shopper, or he did something around fair housing. Yes, for University the, of Chicago. Uh, they, they had people renting the housing for University of Chicago. They owned the housing. And the people who were, I guess, the landlords were not renting out to black students. So they did this undercover thing where two white people would go and they would rent it to them, and then two black people would do it and they wouldn't get it. No, that wasn't what he got arrested for. That's what he did the sit-in for. And the thing he got arrested for was something buses. Basically, they it was a way to segregate education, maintain the segregation of, of the schools in Chicago. They would literally, like, turn buses into classrooms for black students so that they wouldn't have to... Be bused anywhere. Yes. Yeah. I but, feel bad for the listeners. The, the previous uh, section was so much funnier than mine. No, this is hilarious. <laughs> I went to the headquarters and I was like, no one is knocking doors on the south side of Atlanta. <laughs> Give me some signs. I'm going to get some people together. <laughs> and, 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 you know, around that time, it was very grassroots. And I think part of it was, is I'm not sure that, that even Bernie himself knew how far he would get. And they just yes. hadn't built out a strategy for the south. But this is very important. It's very important for anyone who runs because you cannot win a presidential nomination or a presidential election without winning some southern states. And you cannot win southern states without winning black votes. You actually can't win a, an election as a Democrat without winning black votes because we are the most, and it's actually African-American women, right. are the most consistent voting bloc, period. Not just consistently Democratic. African-American women vote more consistently than anyone else in America. That's very important. And I don't think that he paid or his campaign paid enough attention to that. Whereas I think that other candidates may be pandered. Yes. With right. R&B artists. Um, For example. So, right. You know, they, they paid attention right. in the wrong way. Right. But here's the thing. Really, the right way to pay attention is to run black and brown candidates. The way that you find black and brown candidates to run is that you start nurturing them in local offices, in the local elections. So, but what about, I mean, what about the issue of, I mean, I think that's 100% true. I also think that people need to think about when you have someone like a Sanders, how he can reach populations and communities that he wasn't as good at reaching. Well, so you may remember this campaign commercial when it was like America. I've come to look for America. There were no black people. Right. You know, it was Neil Diamond. Wasn't it Paul Simon and... Paul Simon, Neil Diamond, one of those white One white of those guys. white singers, yeah. One of those white guys that, like, not a lot of black people listen to, right. and then you had a commercial with no black people. Right, right, right. You're like Barry Manilow, um, yeah. Like, now, I don't need you to do a commercial with, like, 
Jay Z, and right. I don't need you to walk around talking about you have hot sauce in your bag. Yes. If that's like, don't do that. Right. But there is a middle ground, and part of the reason that middle ground wasn't found is because when you get into the upper levels of the Sanders camp, and when you get into the upper levels of many campaigns in the Democratic Party, and the upper levels of the Democratic Party itself, there are not a lot of black and brown folks. You know, so you have a bunch of white people sitting around with maybe like one or two tokens and saying like how do we how do we appeal to black people and that's how you get things like that painfully awkward Mary J. Blige right. Blige. Like right. Somebody thought that that was a good idea and there weren't enough of us in the room to be like no this is horrible. So that's the first part. It's best to have the candidate but if you can't have a black or brown candidate you definitely need to have black and brown and women and not just in some token right. superficial outward facing position they actually right. need to be in the decision making position and, I, and i'm going to say this thing that's like a little controversial or whatever it is but like we're ready for it yeah i didn't talk about race a lot well that's not true i probably did talk about race a lot because i'm in a majority black district but there are other places i went outside of my district and i don't talk about race a lot i can say the exact same things that bernie says and they're perceived differently because I'm black. And, you know, Barack Obama got away with this a lot. I think he didn't talk about race enough. I, I'm upset with him about it, but the flip side of it is is that it's clear that the president that we have in office is there because we had a black president. And people are very upset at that. I'm not sure why they're upset, because it's not like he hooked black people up. Michael Eric Dyson, whose politics I'm not crazy about, said, like, Obama runs from race like a black man runs from the police. You know, he... His literally saying that, like, his son could have looked like Trayvon Martin was considered talking about race too much. Who would think that that Trayvon Martin comment was him, like, raising a fist at the 1968 Olympics? Exactly. Like, for me to be African-American and talking about income inequality, when people see me talking about it, and specifically when black and brown folks see me talking about it, they get that we are implicitly a part of this. And so I just think that that is... It's just very, very, very important. So when I was running, I came up to the Young Democratic Socialists of America's annual conference. Uh, it was in Flatbush. There were like three black people in the room. I said to yeah. this audience of people, how are we in Flatbush? And there are only, like, I literally, like, I got off the two train. How were there only three black people in the room? Like, right. what is going on right now? After you passed, um, like, 100 black people on the way from the two train, right, to the meeting. Right. And so we we got we to gotta figure out a way to bridge this divide. And I think one of the most important things that we can do to do that is to find black and brown socialists and get them running yes. for office. Yes. Well, we have to wrap up. But this was so great. And I'm actually going to harass you after this. Um, that may be a crime, saying that out loud, To that I'm going to harass a councilman. I don't mean in any inappropriate way. I just mean I'm going to try to get another interview with you. That well, I that's all you want. We haven't even written any ordinances for that yet. So yeah, you're and you would know because uh, you know about South Fulton, whether or not they. So wait, can you can you table that ordinance for like a uh, couple weeks so I can get you know some what? We'll more name interviews? it after you. Yes. We'll, we'll name the ordinance after you. The Katie Halper. Um, Halper's law. That's Halper's law. It. Restrain. It basically will be a restraining order named after me. Oh, I always wanted that. But thank you so much, Councilman Kamau. And your website is Khalid Cares. K H A L I D Cares. And I'm sorry. Dot com. Is it Khalid or Khalid? Because I have friends who pronounce it differently. Yeah, either is fine. Okay. I, I say Khalid. Uh, oh, man. All my cab drivers say Khalid. So oh yes. Whatever. Okay. Fine. Well, thank you so much, and it was so great talking to you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And we just want to remind listeners that if you go to, if you enjoyed that, how great was that, by the way? It was beautiful. I really am going to harass him legally and respectfully because I feel like we barely sp talked about the socialism stuff. We barely talked about what it's like when you're a socialist of color and people pretend you don't exist. But guys, please remember, go to give to WBAI.org. That's give number two WBAI.org. Put in the search bar. Again, this is why we need to raise money because this is how I have to pitch an event. Put in the search bar. And I forgot to say that the guest that night is going to be Angela Nagel, who is the author of Kill All Normies. She writes about the online culture wars. Uh, she's Irish, which is really cool. She's coming in from Ireland just to do this and other things. Um, I'm going to pretend that it's because of this, but that's not true. And... Um, yeah, so make sure you come to that. And she writes a lot about the alt-right. Um, she's a great, great, great guest. And then there's karaoke. So see you guys next week. And don't forget, June 14th. June 14th is that event. you got to buy tickets online. It's only $10. It's nothing. 
Nothing, nothing, nothing. Okay. Thanks, guys. Bye.